Okay, now we record. The love of the father, part two. A picture of his love. Right Read part one. It's on YouTube right now. Amen. You know, as I gave it its title, and I began to just think about his love, I just thought, wow. And you just start thinking about all the scriptures and all the things. God so loved the world, you know, and that he's called us his children. You know, you need to see the first bid and you'll see the scriptures I used about that we've been adopted into his kingdom. And we, we are his children. He loves us so much. Everything on that cross was not for Jesus Christ, it was for us. Everything. Crown of thorns so we can have a sound mind, you know. Feet bloody so we can be healed. Just so much. Everything. He was nailed. He was bound to that cross so we could be free. And on and on. Everything. He was, he was rejected so that we will never be rejected by God. And uh, despised and rejected. He took all our sin upon Himself so that we could just be cleansed and washed and come back into the presence of the Father. Amen. Amen. So this Amen. message here that I'm preaching this morning is a picture. Um, I'm kind of nervous about it because this is the first time I'm actually going to preach a chapter of the Bible or a story and tell you about all the characters that's in the story and reveal who they are in this story so that we can see the Father's love. So we got to get started because we could be here until after the storm passes. <laughs> <laughs> it's all in 2 Samuel chapter 9, it's the whole chapter. And it's this wonderful story about this guy with this little short name, Mephibosheth. You got a mom who named their kid Mephibosheth. <laughs> and then there's like 30 ways to pronounce it, you know. So anyway, probably answered to all of them. But anyway, so we're gonna we're gonna go along in the story. We're gonna look at the different people that's in there and their names, what their names mean, and so forth. And this is how we're gonna get the inner picture. Of the story. The story in itself is just an awesome story. But when you see that it's a story about God the Father's love for us, it's about salvation. It's about what God has done for us, bringing us into His kingdom. You'll see. And all, those, all the pictures and stories of the Bible, when you start to look at the names of the characters of all, there's another whole story there just in their names. So we're going to look at this this morning. So we start off with the first scripture says, one day David asked, is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Nice story. Sounds like he wants to be kind to somebody in King Saul's family. But let's just look at things right now. Saul. King Saul was the first king of Israel. He was rejected by God. He represents the enemy of God. Okay? Saul's name means acts for that's very, very interesting, you know. When you look up these names and you start to think about the character that the name represents, you go, wow. Now, X4, that's pretty interesting because what happened was is that God was rejected by Israel as their king. One day they just told Samuel, we, don't, we want a king like everybody else. And Samuel got really upset and he went to God about it. God said, what are you upset about? They're not rejecting you, Samuel. They rejected me as their king. You know? So Saul is the king that was asked for. Pretty interesting, huh? You know, I could play into this a whole bunch, but basically, it's when it's when we don't want to follow God. We want something else to follow. You know, it's easy to follow, really is would be more how can I say this? It's more easy to follow one, two, three steps than to have a personal relationship. Okay? Some people are like that. They say, just give me some, some things I have to do. But, you know, it's like we're, the law has is, is now been finished and fulfilled with Christ. We're now under the law of love. We're under that relationship with Jesus Christ now. There's no rules to this. You know, I don't need a law that says thou shalt not commit adultery when I'm in love with my wife. Been married to her 43 years. Never committed adultery on her, you know, because I'm in love with her. I don't need a law. I have this law in my heart of love. And that's what the New Testament is all about. So here you got Saul. He was asked for, rejected God in order to have this guy. But he didn't obey God. God said, you go in and kill all the Amalekites. And, and he went in and, and he kept the king and he kept a bunch of good animals. And Samuel came in and says, what is this? 
God gave you a simple task to do, and you're already very short in this ministry and disobeyed God. And God rejected it. God will always reject your king if it's not King Jesus. Amen. Because he will fail. Well, if you've got somebody on that pedestal, you know, if people that even follow me, I'm going to fail. I don't want to fail, but I'm human. And there's going to be a time when I'm going to fail. You know, you might get mad at me when you don't get a phone call, you know, because I'm not perfect. But God's always there listening. God doesn't need a phone. He's right there. Just talk to him. He's right there. Amen? He wants to be your king. And let, him, let him be your king. Now, Jonathan, Jonathan was King Saul's son. He was the friend of David. He represents the friend of God. Now, Jonathan's name means to give, or God has given, or God has given us Jesus. Now, I wrote the Bible, the other two are definition. And just so you can get to understand what I'm talking about, Jonathan represents what God has given. Jonathan was a real close friend to King David. Matter of fact, so much so that Jonathan exchanged, took his war weapons and his cloak and, and gave, gave David all of that. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ has given us, his glory. He has washed us clean and he has covered us with his blood and with his life and with his glory and his presence. He has exchanged our filthy rags of, of self-righteousness and given us the, the, the covering of righteousness and hope and truth. You see? And so this whole story, I don't have a whole lot of time to preach about these individuals, but David and Jonathan, their hearts were knit together, which is a type of Christ that our hearts should be knitted together with Christ. You understand? So this is who Jonathan represents in the story. Friend of God. Jesus Christ. Okay, so got to get these characters coming in your mind. Now David, David became king after. He was a, a man after God's own heart. He became king after King Saul. Uh, after God's own heart, he represents God in the story. David's name means beloved or one who is dearly loved or chosen to represent God. David will sit upon the throne of Israel forever. Now only God can reign and rule forever. So David is like a type of God in the story. Because of what he's about to do, he's doing it as a representative of God. Every one of us, as children of God, are representatives of God. So we need to be that best representation that we possibly can be if we hope to win people to Jesus Christ. Right, right. right. You know, we got to hope to have that, that witness, you know, deny the self, like, like John the Baptist said, you must, I must decrease or Christ increase, you know. So this is who David is in his, in his story. Because his name means to uh, the beloved of the Lord, the friend, the friend of God. He was, he was so many things to God, but he was a man after God's own heart. When, when, he was, when he did wrong and the prophet came, it broke him. Yeah, he was just a person and he still failed God. And so he's not really a, a perfect type of God. And none of the characters that, that are a type of God are perfect. But what, how God forgives them and moves upon their lives and causes them to repent, this all is a, is a representation of the forgiveness of God. So David represents that in, in the story and in his life. In verse 2, he summoned a man named Ziba, who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba the king asked? Yes, I am, Ziba replies. Now, Ziba was a servant of King Saul. Now, his name is, he's an interesting character in the story. Now, Saul, uh, king of Saul, he represents the servant of God's enemy. Kind of interesting thought. Devil is the enemy of God, right? And this would be like demons or servants, okay? Uh, he represents the servant of God's enemy. He was King Saul's servant, right? Okay. Now, Ziba's name means station or to stand at one's post. In other words, he will obey whoever commands him. It's an interesting thing here. I mean, I, I, I'm trying not to give you a ton of explanation because I don't have enough time. But I need to give you enough so you understand what I'm saying. Now, as a born again, blood washed believer, the devils are subject to us. Now, I know some of the stuff I'm going to tell you, you're going to understand, but some of it you're going to go, whoa, <laughs> what's he talking about? All right? 
So the idea is that, okay, there was a story in the Bible when King Ahab was about to die on the battlefield. And he got Micaiah to come. He had 400 prophets that all said, man, you're going to be victorious, you're going to win. And then in Micaiah, they went and got him because Jehoshaphat was part of it. He was a good king. And they went and got Micaiah. They brought him back and they said, look, all the prophets say he's going to succeed. You, you say the same stuff. He said, I'm telling you, I can only say what God tells me to say. So Micaiah comes and he tells them, oh, you're going to win. So, and and uh, the king Ahab said, man, see, he never tells me stuff good. Tell me the truth. He said, I'm going to tell you the truth. I saw Israel scattered on the battlefield as without a shepherd. In other words, you're going to die in this war. And he said, let me tell you what I saw. I saw a throne room in heaven. Okay? And I saw, I saw spirits on the left and the right. Okay? And he said, God was on his throne. And he said, he said, how will we convince Ahab to go fight so he can die? This is the, the picture he saw in heaven. And all the spirits began to give him all kind of suggestions. And this one spirit kind of raises his hand in the back and God addresses him. He said, I'll, tell, I'll do it. And he said, well, how will you do it? He said, I'll go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of these 400 prophets. A lying spirit. This is not an angel of heaven. This is devils. Even in the book of Job, the devil had to come to the assembly. He's in the background. Kind of like, I don't want to be here. And God addresses him. He, he addresses Satan. He said, have you, have you checked out my servant Job? So when God calls an assembly, even the demons have to show up. You know, Even the devil himself has to show up. Well, this is a lying spirit. He said, go and do that. So he was a lying spirit in the mouth of the 400 prophets of Ahab to get him to go to war. And he dies in that battle fulfills prophecy about it. So this picture here is that demons are subject to you. I mean, we're supposed to have the, the authority and the power to cast out devils. You know, I have done that in the prison ministry, down in Reggio, and uh, you know, in the Word of God, it shows you when demons were cast out. The Lord cast out devils all the time. He told the disciples, cast out devils. So we have that authority in Christ. But because of being born again and the Spirit of God lives in us, man, when the devil manifests itself, you have the authority to cast it out. And the demons are pretty much waiting for some type of a, of a command. And when they were inside of like that one boy, and the, uh, pot, the disciples couldn't cast them out, and Jesus came down out of the Mount of Transfiguration, rebuked them for their lack of faith, and commanded that thing to come out, and it rent into worse. He, they, people thought he was dead, but then he got up, he wasn't dead devil was cast out. They had to obey him. And they have to obey you too. Amen? Amen. You know, the Bible tells us, like in, in Mark 16, go ye in all the world, preach the gospel, and he said, cast out devils and heal the sick. They, they, that uh, the believers shall lay hands on the sick. And there's a lot of powerful scriptures in the Word of God. But we, have, we can cast out devils in Jesus' name. And man, they are everywhere. You know, people say, where are they? I'll tell you where they are. They sit in church. They, they hang out with Christians yeah. because they're always trying to put their little two cents in. I know a lot of times when I'm praying for people, my first thing I say to them, not to the person, but to the demons, I tell them to shut up in Jesus' name. Because they're speaking to them. They're, they're trying to, you know, can you imagine being in the room of a, of a lot of people and they're all going, no, 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 whilst you're trying to talk, you know, or the band's playing extremely loud. All you see is the person's mouth moving. But then you got to just get it quiet. In Jesus' name, I command you to shut up so that you can hear the voice of God. You can hear what I'm saying, too, when I cast this thing out, you know? So, we got this picture now of Zebra is. I, I pondered on him for a while and uh, got a few few pictures in my mind, a couple of things that happened with, with Zebra. And uh, and he was evil at one point and deceived his master, now, uh, Fibishev. And when David came back after Absalom was killed, and he had deceived him and didn't have him come with, with um, David to flee. So anyway, Zeba is, is, you might look at him as like, it depends on, it depends on whose side. You know, in other words, he's going to be on one side or the other, depending on who's pulling the strongest. In this case, David, who is God, is actually causing Zeba to be the servant. Of, of, of 
Think about that for a minute. That even the demons. You know, when Israel would conquer a nation and they didn't destroy them, they would turn all their people into workers. They had to haul water, break rock. They had to, they had to be servants. They'd be slaves and, and carry and, and take care of the nation of Israel. So the demons are actually, they have to obey you. You know, when you cast the devil out to set a person free, they have to go. And that person can receive Christ. You know, so this is this, is this guy, Z, but that's what he represents in his story. Verse 3 says, The king then asked him, Is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. Ziba replies, Yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He is crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. And Lodabar. Uh, Ziba told him, At the home of Makar, a uh, son of Abiel. But anyway, so we got another piece of the story here. But notice something. He says the son of John, he doesn't give his name, he doesn't give his name right now. Okay? There's a reason for that, we're going to see it in a minute. But right here we've got this piece. He describes him, tells him where he is, names the other people. And there's some interesting things that's a lot jammed into that one scripture now. He says he is crippled in both feet. Uh, what, that, what that means is he couldn't work. Alright? And that was that's what it represented. He couldn't walk. He couldn't work. He had to depend on other people. And you're going to see where he's living and the, the end result of it, of having these broken feet, which is a spiritual thing. The spiritual meaning is no one can work their way into heaven. Isn't that simple? You know, there's nothing he could do to better his life. And the better your life would be to be a, a born again, blood washed Christian going to heaven, right? You know, and there's no way that you can do any kind of works to get the favor of God except believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And it's by faith, no works, it says in Ephesians 1, so that nobody can boast about that. So the only, the only work that's accepted was the work of the cross. Amen? Amen. And so this is what his feet represent. This guy he's going to show favor to has broken feet. He can't walk, can't better his life. He's a mess. Now there's a, there's a town that they live in, Lodabar. Has anybody heard of that title before? Anybody read the story? Well, I got a fresh meat this morning. <laughs> Lodabar was a ghetto town during biblical times. What is Lodabar? The Hebrew word lo meaning nothing. That's pretty interesting. Nothing. It means nothing. Meaning nothing. And Debar means no pasture. The root word for Debar is no promise. You're just going to die. There's no hope. Now watch, watch this from here. Yeah. Lodabar is a physical place and or state of mind. When a person is in constant fear, perpetual feeling of loneliness and depression, feeling unloved, unwanted, uh, forgotten, worrying, feeling of being unsuccessful, unappreciated, etc. Feeling, feeling of being trapped with no way out, exiled, and cut off. Modern term of Lord of Law is, is a belief system that is contrary to the Word of God, which leads to strongholds, uh, a state of despair without hope. Who wants to live there? Anybody? Have any volunteers? Who <laughs> settled in Lord of Law? So, Lodabar, this is the definition. This is what the city means. That's incredible, though. So, he lived in Lodabar. He lived in this frame of mind. I can't better my life. I can't get these feet fixed so I can go to work. I'm just here. Now, it gets worse. <laughs> this whole paragraph, this whole one scripture gets worse. So, let me go to the name of my car, okay? Means, now, what? Look, read this one. You're reading ahead of me, I see. To sell, literally, as merchandise, a daughter in marriage into slavery, or figurative, to surrender at all, self away, and this is the definition of the Strong's record. Uh, the name Amiel means a people, okay? When you put these two names together, you get a people or a person sold into slavery. The truth is, the devil has sold the human race into slavery. 
Well, does this give you the picture of who this guy Mephibosheth is? He is just an unsaved person. I mean, spiritually speaking. And the people out there, they're all walking in fear. They don't know what tomorrow holds. They don't know where they're going to go when they die. You know, I mean, with the, I've talked to them, you've talked to them, and people out there, they just, you know, they, they, have, no, they have hopelessness. They, you know, they, they're striving, they're trying to forget about that and work and make money and have good things, but every night they do what you and I do. They lay their head on the pillow. And then they, all that stuff so is coming. They're on drugs, they're on alcohol. Why? Because they're so depressed. They're so beat down. They don't understand that when Adam sinned, you know, when he sinned, all of a sudden their eyes were open and they saw that they were naked. And, and not only were they naked, but they were getting ready to get kicked out of the garden. Said, so you want to be like God? I'm going to give you the planet. Go have fun. Thorns and thistles and murder and rape and, you know, everything bad that they had to, to live their lives and try to overcome. Get their crop growing just about ready to harvest and a, and a whole thing of locusts would come in and eat it. How depressing that must be. Anybody ever felt that way? You, put, you take one step forward and two backwards, you know? And you're not even taking a step, but you're sliding the whole floor. <laughs> That's what Lodabar and living in this life. So all the characters in this story are telling like another story, right? This is how the Word of God is written. You can properly interpret, you know, the names. You can, and you can see some wonderful truth that will stand out and uh, give you another whole picture. And it's going to always point to Christ. I'll tell you that right now. All the stories going to going to uh, point right to the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. That's Amen. pretty awesome, huh? Amen. So David sent for him and brought him from Machir's home. So David, the one chosen to represent God, brings Jonathan's son out from slavery. Isn't that neat? His name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson. When he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, Greetings, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Which is a good statement. I mean, I want to serve the Lord. You know, I want to uh, yield to his calling and the Holy Spirit. But that's not what he's saying here. He is responding to David in respect to how he sees himself. This word here in the um, New Living Translation doesn't do it to its justice because really he's saying, I'm a slave. Because that's his mentality. You know, in this world, you just have to, to sit back and take a look. I'm the type of person who likes to observe. I never cared about playing sports, but I didn't mind watching sports. I like to look and see what's happening around me. You know, and, uh, and so just looking at this world and seeing what they're doing, I can understand that they're coming from different environments, they're coming from different places, schools, and, and you know, and they and they bring in with them the mentality of the area, of the culture, you know, and you know, I'm a child, I'm a child of God. If they're not saved, then they fit into some slot in this in this in this world, right? You know, and with many people, they have this poor mentality about themselves. Even when they come to Christ, as a minister for 32 years, I've counseled many people, and all I do, get them, get them started to talk, and then I get quiet, just listen to them. Let them tell me about their life, and what they do a lot of times is they start, they start confessing. And I know I haven't been really praying like I should, I haven't been going to church, and, and I'm just listening. And they will tell me in a matter of anywhere from five to ten minutes, they will tell me what's up here. The kind of bondages and strongholds that they have. And I'm talking about Christian people that have this mentality. Their tongue will tell me what's going on inside of them. And after I listen, if I just get quiet and just listen, after a few minutes, I can make a statement, you know, back to them at what I'm hearing them say. You know, and I, I'll say, you know, this. I say, well, let me tell you what I see here. And I'll tell them. I remember one guy I told him, I said, you're having a problem loving your wife because you don't love God. I just let him talk. And I didn't know how he was going to react when I told him that. And I just waited and he got quiet. But then I, he looked up and he said, you're right. And I really don't love God. So how can you love somebody else if you don't 
have the love of God who is love. He who doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. It says in 1 John. So anyway, the fellowship is saying, I am your slave. He has put him down to the lowest scale in relationship to King David. I don't mind even Paul put himself down to that level too. You know, he said, I'm the slave of Christ. You know, but there's a there's actually a positive way to think that way when you yourself yield and surrender to a person rather than to be made into a slave. You understand? You see, the devil had totally, you know, kidnapped him and turned him into a slave, a slave of his own life, a slave of his broken leg, a slave to fear, worry about whether or not I'm going to ever have a meal or not. Wondering if, you know, I live in Lodeboy, it's bad. You know, one of the definitions for Lodeboy was no pasture land. You can't even you can't even raise cattle because there's there's nothing for the cattle to eat. <laughs> it's bad. Lodeboy's a bad place. And that's like hell, you know. Anyway. Now, the name of Fibership means, now this is interesting. His name means one who destroys shame. Or shame no more. Now it's very interesting that he's really got a positive definition about who he is. But he's not living in what his name means. Are you with me? He's not living in what his name means. Now I wrote down here at the bottom, uh, his name is revealed after he is brought to King David. That's interesting because until we come to Christ, you will never know who you are. I mean, Christians today, many of them don't even know the gifts they have in them, and they're Christians. They could be sitting in God's presence and talking to God, and uh, God revealing the gifts and the callings that's inside, you know, of themselves. And but but they're not. They still they just I got saved. I'm good. I'm going to heaven. And then they just live their life and go to church periodically or whatever. And and but they're not getting any type of revelation and truth and understanding not just of who Jesus is, but who they are. You know, in Psalms 139, it says that the, the psalmist wrote, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And God, he said, God was looking inside the womb when I was being formed. He saw my, my body parts that were fit together perfectly. But it wasn't just body parts. It was gifts and callings and, and who this person will be is God put him inside of that little life, a living soul that contains the will and purpose of everybody's existence. You live by the will and purpose of your life. But if your soul is in captivity, then so will your spirit. And so if your spirit's in captivity, you'll never, ever reach the potential of who you could be. Jesus came to show us the way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? The Gospel of John, uh, chapter 14, verse 6. On the way, the truth, and the life. And that word way, why is he the, the way? Because he is the way unto life. You know, that he has come to show us abundant life, as it says in the Gospel of John chapter 10. Amen. The devil's come to, to kill, steal, and destroy. But I have come to bring life and bring it more abundantly. That word in the Greek, that if you study it out, it just it means to bring forth what, what is inside. To bring forth, you know. You see an acorn, you see a, a pecan, or one of these hard shell nuts laying on the ground rotten. That's a travesty. That will never, never happen in heaven. You see, that's, that nut represents something tender and good on the inside. But there's this hard shell that needs to be broken. These are all revelations and truth. See, God made these nuts to show us things like that. You know, and if you get the revelation, understand that there's this hard shell that's around us just for being born on this earth. We call it a sin nature. And it just it just traps us. And God has come to break us, to break us out of this prison of this world. And to have the mind of Christ, to be able to think like Christ, and to follow his way. Every step that he's ever done, follow him. You know, get saved and go get born and baptized and then begin to read your words or study and to and to get yourself into that mode of step keep keep moving forward in the Lord. 
God's got, you know, God's not going to reveal everything about yourself as soon as you get saved. He's waiting for you to make the move. Proverbs 25, it says that it's for God to hide a thing. Well, He has hidden gifts and callings inside of you. But it's for kings to search them out around. You know, if you, if you want to find out who you are, you've got to decide to be a king, not a pauper, not a peasant. So God didn't save us as a peasant to leave us that way. That's what the story is all about. His name is positive, but he's living opposite. He says, one who destroys shame, he's living as a person who lives in shame, embarrassed. Shame them all, shame every day. And God is about to change all of that in his life. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, John. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Wow. Now, I just told you about all the characters. Now he's talking about Jonathan who exchanged, and he pretty much has a picture of salvation in exchange because of Jesus Christ. Isn't that cool? He said, you will no longer be sitting around in the house wearing rags, wondering if you're going to eat today. You'll eat at my table. Wow. Psalm 23 comes alive in my head. He prepares a table in front of the enemy. He say, come and eat. They don't have to die as an enemy of God. They can repent and come and eat at this table too. Amen. 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 God is saying to David, I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan, who is Jesus Christ. That's an interesting statement because he's saying to your father. But if you go into Isaiah, who is called Everlasting Father in Isaiah 9, 6. Jesus Christ is called Everlasting Father. You see, what that means is, is that he will be, he is the eternal revelation of who the Father is. Because we never will see the Father, I don't think, because he lives invisible. And he lives in a dark cloud, it says in the Psalms too, but we see Jesus who is the expression of God the Father. So he is the everlasting revelation of the Father in, in Isaiah 9, 6. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather Saul. God is saying that he will give back everything that the devil has stolen. Now you can find that in the Old Covenant. He says it a few times in the prophet books. He said, I'll give you back the stuff that the locusts and the canker worm and the caterpillar has eaten. Now, in that case, it could be material things, but it's not necessarily that. But I guarantee you, he will give you back the ability to, to think and receive. You see, all that was lost with Adam. Adam was very, very intelligent. I mean, he had the mind of God. And when God brought him all the animals, he named them. I mean, we couldn't even come up with enough sounds to name all the animals and insects that's out there. But he named them, you know. I'm sure he had a pet name and, and he had, I'll call this one, he might even have a scientific name for him. But he, because he was just intelligent because he, he was the image of God. But then he said, and we became very stupid. And he brought us all into stupidity. I don't care how smart you are, we are so dumb compared to God, right? Yes. And, uh, but he's saying, I'll give you back what the devil took from Adam and Eve. That's what he's saying right there. I'll give you the ability. You know, you're sitting here listening to me interpret a whole chapter, taking their names and looking up, and you are in a, like, some people took, man, it's like a college lesson. I don't know what level this is, but when I read the Bible, this is what I see. And it didn't start out that way 40 years ago. I read it just like everybody else. What is this? What is this saying? What in the world does this mean? But I had I just kept asking God questions, got me a nice study Bible, began to explore. But there's some things that are not taught because only the Holy Spirit can unlock them. Amen? Like Paul said in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12, he said, A new man 13 years ago. He went to paradise in, the, in his body and out. I don't know. But he came to knowledge and revelation of God. You know? And God is doing that right now inside of us. I have not seen, neither ear heard, neither entered in the heart the things God has prepared for those that love him. First Corinthians chapter 2. But in verse 10 he says, God is revealing them to us by his spirit. Amen. Yes. 
And you're born again if you receive it. Because God has given us the mind of Christ in that same chapter. We have the mind of Christ to understand. You know, how many of y'all, you might not totally grasp what I'm saying, but you can, you're comprehending what I'm saying about the story. Amen. This is about salvation, about what Christ has done. You see, because you have the mind of Christ that's helping you to understand the Holy Spirit that's inside of you. So God said, I'm going to give back everything that Adam lost. I'm going to give you back that, how the Spirit of God, and He walked with God, He's now walking with us again. Giving that all back to us. Amen? Mephibosheth well, bowed <clears throat> respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you should show such kindness to him? Look at him, he looks at himself. A dead dog like me. Then the king summoned Saul's servant, Seba, and said, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. Now, Seba didn't steal all of that. But somewhere was all of this property. And somebody had it. I don't know who. It doesn't say. Was it, was it Simba? Was he living on the land? I don't know. But David's telling him, hey, everything that belonged to his grandfather and to his dad, I'm giving back to him right now. Now, Simba, he says, you and your sons, now what he's telling him? He's telling Simba. You and your sons and servants are to form the land for him to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table. Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Ziba uh, replied, Yes, my lord the king, I am your servant, and I will do all that you have commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's own sons. I don't know if Ziba, it's pronounced Ziba actually, D E B A. And uh, was he a happy camper in this? I don't know. He might have been working the land for himself. But now, because you know, think about the servants after the master died and all. I mean, they had they had access to what they had access to when they worked for Saul, okay? So I don't know who owned the property. There's no way in the world that you could ever find out. But if now I don't care who's on that property, it's going back to Mephibosheth. Giving back when the, the, the locusts and the kangaroo and the caterpillar has eaten in his life. One minute he's a, he's a pauper, he's sitting with rags on, not knowing where the next meal's coming from. Next minute he's sitting at the king's table and now has more fields than he'll ever know what to do. He still can't work them. But this. Ziba, who represents the servant of the enemy of God, is now being forced by David, you will work the land and all those under you. That's pretty serious business. That means that once you came to the Lord, that demon that had been messing with you is now has to serve you. Wow. So, you know, I think I, I love messing with him. Let's tell him. Tell you what you need to do today, devil. <laughs> you need to go convince that person they need Jesus. How about that? Amen. <laughs> that demon must go, man. You don't have any choice. That's what I'm saying here. You're going to work that land. The Fibbishep had a young son named Michael. From then on, that's all it says about him. All the members of Zebra's household were the Fibbishep's servants. Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly at the king's table. That's all it said about this, this son he has, the extension of who he is as a person. Now, <coughs> the name Michael means humble. Isn't that interesting? Humble or who is like the Lord. That's what the definition of Michael means. He came from his loins. He is an extension of who Mephibosheth is. All it says is he has a son named Michael. Period. End of story. You find him in a couple of other places in the Bible, but only only as a name, nothing descriptive about him particularly. But I think you might find out as it goes into the lineage, it says his name, and then it might say his son's name in one place in Chronicles, I think. But anyway, his name means humble. So now the extension that now God has, has given him is humble. You see? 
Now he says he's a servant. He's saying it as I want to be, not I have to be. You see what I'm saying? I don't have to be commanded to love God. I love God. I don't need a command to tell me to worship God. I understand that He deserves all my worship. Amen. You see? The last thing is, the end of the story is, when you see Mephibosheth, you'll be seeing the love of King David. Think about it. Think about it. He's at now sitting at the table. He's wearing prince garments now. They're not rags anymore. He's got, he's got a, um, a mule rod. That's what they mostly grow it back then. He, if he goes to town, gets on that mule and goes to town, what do people see? They look at him and see the love of King David. Amen. It was King David that transformed him. Now, but what do they see? David, the spiritual meaning, when you see a Christian, you'll be seeing the love of the Father. Amen? Amen. When people see us and we're not cursing, we're not bitter, we're not getting into idle conversation, we're not doing things that the world does, well, who are you, man? Why, why is, you know, like I said this before, when, we, when I was getting this building, mold remediated, guy dropped off his workers, and then he came back, and he walked with me from the front of the building to the back, and I mean, he was happening all the way through the building, complaining about the government, complaining about everything. And I didn't say anything, all the way to the back. When I got to the back of the building with him, he went, man, I've been talking the whole time. He said, well, who are you in relationship to this building? I said, well, I own the building, and I said, and this is going to be a church, and I'm the pastor of the church. <laughs> and he went, oh, man, I've just been cursing all the way from one end to the other. And, he said, and from that point all the way back, not one curse where he came out of I just loved him and prayed for him. Later on, that same guy wound up committing suicide. So, yeah. Some years, a couple of years later. But anyway, I prayed for him. And I tried to lead him to Christ. He just wasn't. He just wasn't like you know. And uh, you just can't make a person to see Christ. But the idea is that you know something is different and should be different. That's cool. Stand with me. Let's just. Let's just pray. Let's just talk to God. You know, in the light of this whole story, did, did anything in particular catch your attention in relation to you as an individual? Did uh, the loaded ball, anybody in here, did the loaded ball kind of show you a little something about yourself and where you are mentally in some areas of your life? God has come to deliver you from loaded ball. Come to set you free from that that depression and that poor mentality if you're looking out and seeing. You know, God is waiting for you to come and sit at his table. Amen. And come and come and put the garments of righteousness on. So how do I do that? Just worship him. Amen. Just give him the praise. That's that's how easy that is. Just give him all your affection and love. You know? And, I mean, I repent every morning when I when I talk and walk with God, and um, I don't even know, you know I, I can't even, you know, I, I didn't sin yesterday that I know of, but I know that I'm, my, my flesh still says and has like an attitude at times, and it, and it shows up, and my wife will see it. I don't see it, <laughs> but she sees it. It lets me know, and then I go. <laughs> she, says, she sees my attitude. Amen. Amen. But anyway, and I, uh, I repent every day because I'm a flesh creature like everybody else. But I'm born again. And I know that I, I want to keep that channel open. I want to keep that, that communication open. So that if I'm out somewhere just driving in the car, I can hear his voice say, one time I heard him say, don't drive out from behind this alley fast. Because I was doing that. I was working with my brother at the time. And I would park in the back, come up this alley, and people would park like this down there, down you know, in front of the little storefronts over there. And I would just go zip it out of there to, to Shepherd to the highway. And then one day, man, I just, I was a young person, and the Holy Spirit said, don't pull out of here like you do all the other days. So I took my time and got to the edge of the building, and man, this guy come out, whoa, right in front of me, took off. And if I, I mean, it would have been bad. But I really heard the Spirit tell me, don't come out like this. And from that point on, I think my time, I would take my time to come out around that building. But you know, 
We need to keep the channel open. Yes. We need to know that, that he loves you so much. His death on the cross was not for him. It's for his love for you. The love of the Father, he just loves us so much. I was watching a movie that was done by a bunch of Calvinists. And it was a good movie. But their point about everything is about Christ was so strong that we were out of the equation. And that's what I saw in the movie, and I thought, man, you gotta, I, don't, I can't grab hold of that. I know it is totally about Christ and His love, but He took, he took us. I was thinking about us being like a, a rotten, decaying box, just a box that is you know, just starting to decay. It has no value at all. That's what we were. But then we cleaned it up, put a diamond in it. Now that box becomes very, very valuable. But it's not the box. It's the diamond that's in there. When God decided to clean us up, we still look the same. It was funny. My wife was putting up the video on her computer, and I came into the, to the office at the house. And I came by, and I saw me, and I was preaching. It was what I did here Saturday. And I walked by, and I went, man, I see that guy every day. <laughs> And she went, what guy? I said, that guy. I said, I see him every day in the mirror. What? She just couldn't. I said, I see that guy every day in the mirror. And she went, wait a minute. She couldn't. I said, Julie, that's me. I see me in the mirror every day. She started laughing. But it was like, she was busy. And so she did not grasp what I was. I just walked by and said, I see that guy every day. I know that. I know who it's in me. I know who I am. And I look, and as a matter of fact, I've, I've aged a little bit too, you know. This is the first time I've seen myself in the mirror. And uh, <laughs> aged a little bit, not much. A little bit. Yeah. You know, praise God. But anyway, anyway. But inside of me is the kingdom of heaven. Inside of me is God Himself. Holy Spirit. I have went from being of no value to becoming extremely valuable. Yes. Valueless. It's priceless, should I say. Not valueless, but priceless. Amen. That's who you are. So to just stay on Christ, I think, does him an injustice. Because then we lose that picture of the love of God. You see how important the fifth shepherd became? He was of no value whatsoever. If he had died, nobody would have cared. And he didn't care. Now, he's sitting along with the sons of the king, eating the king's food, dressed in royal garments. He's become very, very valuable, reflecting the love of David. You become very valuable, reflecting the love of Christ. Amen. Amen. God has he's committed himself to you. He's God. I mean, that's awesome, huh? Yes. He's committed himself to fix the stuff that's wrong with you. It'll be finished in heaven, but that's a work that's still being done in your life. You may have noticed that you've changed a little bit since you've been saved. Yeah. Yeah. Now that, well then. Yeah. Thank you, Lord, for changing me. But I still have things. Forty years on the Lord, I still have things that need to be changed. Amen. I need to believe stronger. I need to focus stronger. I need to listen to what is good. Like I told a group of people one time, I said, man, we need to get rid of the secular stuff. Not that it's going to send you to hell and not that some of it is, you know, that bad. But it's not feeding you, you know. It's like eating candy all day long. It's just not doing it, okay? You just need to, if you're going to, if you're going to listen to something, listen to something that's going to feed your soul. That's a theology. It's not a law. It's not a command. It's just a suggestion. Amen. So just bow your head for just a minute. Let's just close out in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this morning. I thank you right now because your spirit is here so loud and so powerful. And I pray right now for everyone that heard this message. That you, I just, I just, I, I was not sure how this message was going to go. But I watched you, watching you begin to move upon people in the sanctuary. 
as they began to understand, I saw it on their faces. That is incredible. I, thank you, God. So I just lift them all up to you right now. We just pray together and agree that we will yield and surrender to the Holy Spirit who is faithful and just, completing the work that He's begun in us.